so this is all about centripetal force. It's a part of the A-level physics syllabus in circular motion. So previously, in my previous video, we talked about how objects would move in circles. And when an object moves in a circle, we can actually prove that there is a force that's acting on it. Because if there is a, a circle, let's say we are, this is a hand, as unhandly as it seems, and we're whirling a ball about in this trajectory right here. Well, we've previously said that the direction of motion of the ball is going to be at a tangent to its circular path at that instant, right? Um, and this is constantly changing. And therefore, we can say that for an object that travels around in a circle, the speed can remain the same. So long as you, you know, don't add even more force using your hand, you keep your muscle position the same. Um, and therefore, the speed can remain the same. However, the velocity will always be changing because the direction is changing and velocity is a vector quantity. Um, and that's why there is acceleration, because acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. That's what acceleration is. And so we can prove that there is a force using Newton's first law. It says that an object stays at rest or in a state of uniform motion unless acted on by a resultant force. And by uniform motion, this means that you have to have the same magnitude but also the same direction. And although we have the same magnitude here, we don't have the same direction and therefore it doesn't stay in a state of uniform motion. Therefore, there is a resultant force. We can also prove this using F equals MA, which is Newton's second law. We have proved that there is a delta v, there is a change in velocity, therefore there is something here, and therefore there is a force. This is not zero, so there is something here which is a resultant force, and this resultant force we call the centripetal force. The centripetal force is defined as the resultant force of an object that is moving around in a circle directed towards the middle of the circle and at right angle to the velocity of the object instantaneously and that makes very much sense because you know whatever string we're holding this is the thing that is applying the force the centripetal force and this is also the radius of the circle and we all know that the radius and the tangent to the circle and when it meets that's going to be 90 degrees so that's what centripetal force is uh, if we take this, this is basically the trajectory of the ball that we were talking about just now. Uh, and then we take these two paths and then we put this little vector thing and we shift it downward so that it's connected to this. We're going to get something like this, which is a vector triangle. And this is how we can determine the delta V, how much in velocity it has changed as it moved from here to here around in a circle. Um, well, we can first of all see that it's approximately at right angles to the velocity at, that it was before. However, this is only when delta v goes very close to zero, which means that, you know, these two balls are very close together. They didn't actually move apart that much, which means that this would go very close to this as delta v becomes very small, right? Um, that's only when we have right angles because... Over here, we can clearly see that this is smaller than a right angle. But when it becomes like this, it will become very close to 90 degrees. And when it's 90 degrees, we can also prove that it's directed towards the center of that circle. And therefore, as delta V becomes very close to zero, um, because acceleration is delta V divided by delta T, acceleration is also towards the center of the circle, same as that of delta V. Delta V is approximately at 90 degrees so acceleration happens towards the center of the circle an alternative way to prove this is f equals ma the same force is causing the change in velocity as well as the acceleration and therefore they're both in the same direction which is at right angles and also towards the center why does speed stay the same and how is it possible to explain how speed stays the same while um, there is an acceleration or a resultant force. Well, we can just prove that there is no force component in the direction of motion. And we can see that if this was the trajectory, and we're going to use this ball again, um, this is the force towards the center and at right angles to the motion. 
this force has no component at all in this direction. We can very clearly prove this using f um, cosine 90 is 0 because cosine 90 equals to 0. This is 90 degrees. If, you know, force was like here, then we could resolve this and we could have a component in the y direction as well as the x direction. However, it's not and it has zero component in this direction. All of its force is only towards this. We can also have an alternative way of proving this. The alternative is that we can talk about the energy, right? So we can, first of all, define work done. Work done is force times distance. And when we're talking about the distance right here, we're talking about the distance moved in the direction of the force. And we, when we talk about the ball, right, um, the force is acting along the radius, but the ball moves like this. So it doesn't move at all, like into the circle or towards the center of the circle, which means that distance moved in the direction of the force equals to zero. So work done is also equal to zero which means that when this force doesn't have any work that it does onto that object, its energy doesn't change, which is to say that the kinetic energy of the ball does not change, and therefore speed will remain constant because the kinetic energy is half mv squared. So this uh, remains the same, this remains the same, which means speed will also remain the same. And that's how we prove that speed is not affected by this like 90 degrees acceleration into the center of the circle. Um, so next we can talk about how there's only one correct speed to reach a certain height when you want to put something in the air so that it orbits the earth like our telephone satellites. There's only one correct speed and we can prove that later when we get the equations. Um, but that also means this is something that I think Isaac Newton proved, which is that when there is a satellite, uh, we can launch it at a too slow speed and that's going to be overcome the, the, by the centripetal force into the center of the Earth, which is gravity basically. It's going to be overcome and it's going to land on Earth. If we do it a little bit faster, but not still not fast enough, it's also going to be overcome and then land on Earth. There's only one speed that we can actually launch it at where it's going to stay in the orbit and it's going to travel in this orbit where it's not going to be overcome by the centripetal force. If it's way too fast, it's actually going to leave this orbit and um, move out because the centripetal force is not enough to keep it in place. And I think this is very cool because, I mean, speed is a continuous um, quantity and that means engineers have to somehow get this very exact and specific speed in order to make it like launch correctly and I find that pretty cool because I mean it surely is pretty difficult to do that uh, but yeah I thought that was pretty cool so before we get the equation of how we can relate centripetal force acceleration as well as like the speed of the object that is going around in a circle we can talk about these basic relationships so Imagine you are also holding that ball that we talked about on the string and you're holding the end of the string and you're whirling it about in the air. Um, you could probably get a good grasp of how it works. The bigger the mass of the string and the, the, the ball and the heavier the ball is, the higher centripetal force you're going to need to apply to actually keep it in that motion. The faster you want it to go around your hand, the more force you will have to put. So therefore, bigger M or bigger B is higher centripetal force needed, which is to say that force is directly proportional to M and force is directly proportional to V. Um, and this force is specifically centripetal force, right? However, when you're using a longer string and the ball is even further away from your hand, you actually don't need to put as much centripetal force, which means that force, centripetal force is inversely proportional to the radius, the distance of the ball towards your hand, which is basically the center of the circle traje trajectory that's going to travel along. So yeah, now we have these things. We can actually talk about how we can get this equation. It's first of all use useful to uh, take a look at the circle. And let's say this is the trajectory that the ball goes around in. We have two of those, right? And so in a certain time t, and therefore in delta t, this will move from here right to here. Um, and so let's say that delta t becomes extremely close to zero, 
which means this is going to be like very, very close to zero. If that happens, we can basically assume that this is a 90 degrees triangle, as well as, you know, this thing right here is not a, a curved arc shape, but it's actually very similar to just a straight line because this is going to be so small, right? So now that we have that, um, we can basically say that as delta t goes very close to zero, um, we can do this. And then we can say that this is like 90 degrees as delta t becomes very close to zero. And we can basically say that this is a straight line when the triangle starts looking like that, right? So it's basically just widening this by a whole lot. But in reality, the circle that we're looking at, the, the, the triangle that we're looking at, or the sector, will look very close to like a straight line, actually, as delta t becomes close to zero. Uh, once we have that, we can also have our vector triangle. So let's say we bring this guy down. And what our vector triangle would look like is that it would look something like this. So this is the direction that it was traveling in last time. Um, oh, hold on. This is not it. This is the direction it was traveling in last time. And then you would also have like a new thing. So let's say we bring this down and this is like here or something. Uh, that's the vector triangle brought down. And this, as we talked about earlier, is delta velocity. So V1, V2, we can represent it with a vector triangle. The difference will be the difference in velocity. Now that we have this, we know what this is. Well, let's say that we do. That's delta theta. Well, this is 90 degrees. And that means that this is also going to be delta theta. We can prove that very easily. Um, and why is this and this, the angle here, 90 degrees? Well, we basically said that uh, delta t is going close to zero and therefore this vector triangle is actually very close to a line. So it wouldn't look like this. In reality, it would just look like a line, but we're basically enlarging that by a whole lot in order to kind of create this to prove it. So that's 90 degrees, which gives us, you know, this is 90 degrees, and then this is 90 degrees minus delta theta, right? And this whole angle here is 90 degrees. So why this little thing here is 90 degrees is because 90 degrees minus this angle will equal to delta theta. And that's why we can prove that the um, angle in the vector triangle is equal to the angle of the arc. I hope that made sense. So now that we have that, we can say that um, because the delta theta here is arc divided by radius, which means the angle over here is delta V divided by V1. Now that they're the same, we're using the same ratio. Um, that means, you know, delta theta is delta V divided by delta 1, which is initial velocity. Oh no, did I say delta? Delta V divided by V1, which is initial velocity. And therefore we can just put this and push it over here. We get V1 is delta theta equals to delta velocity. Now we can divide this thing by delta T, which means we get this and this. Now this is basically acceleration. Acceleration is the change of velocity divided by the change in time. And so we can denote this by A. Over here, we know that um, omega, or angular velocity, is equal to angular displacement, aka delta theta, divided by delta t, which is delta time. And so we can actually cross this out and we can put omega right here, which finally gives us the equation A is V1, which is like the initial velocity that we were talking about, the velocity right here, times angular velocity, omega. We can also prove this. Uh, we can also expand on this even further. We know that the speed of a certain object is the angular velocity times the radius, and that's also mentioned in my previous video. 
um, and therefore the angular velocity is speed divided by radius if we put it over here and we can basically substitute this into this equation and at the end we get acceleration is v squared divided by r so that's about it you can also do the exact opposite thing and you can say that v equals to omega r right and then you can put this and you can substitute it into here which gives us a is omega squared r so you can use any of these two equations in order to get the relationship between the acceleration you should have towards the center of the circle um, and the velocity that you're going to actually be moving around the circle in the speed that you're going to be moving around the circle in and that's divided by the ratio and that is the relationship between these two things and we know that you know acceleration is affected by speed uh, it's affected by force and that really can explain a lot of what we said earlier because we did say that if you have a bigger mass or a bigger um, velocity, then you're going to need a higher centripetal force. If you need a bigger velocity, this goes up, which means acceleration has to go up, which means that force has to go up. If you have a bigger mass, acceleration will go up because F equals MA. Um, oh no, force is going to go up because... Um, m will go up and then acceleration if it stays the same you're still going to need more force and then for radius we can see that if you have a bigger radius you actually have a lower acceleration and that's why you need less force so it can over um, explain the relationships that were mentioned earlier on and lastly we can use this very handy equation that we found to do a whole bunch of stuff so we know that f equals ma so since a is b squared divided by r or a is omega squared r we can basically say that f is m times v squared divided by r or m times r times omega squared we can also talk about orbital speed and this is only for objects that are orbiting the earth um, for g right which is our value of g is 9.81 so this is only for things around the earth like this well, then we know that the weight, aka the centripetal force, is going to be mg. So mg is going to be f, mg is equal to this, and you can basically cross out the mass, and you get g is the speed squared divided by r. And you can actually put real values in here. So assuming that this is on Earth, and assuming that it's not so far away from the Earth that the radius um, is very significantly different from the radius of the earth and also assuming that it's close enough to a surface that g stays the same then we have g equals 9.81 and r will be approximately equal to the radius of the earth which is 6400 km and um it's just like so big compared to the orbit that it's actually going to go around in that we can just say that you know the radius of the orbit is going to be very very close to the radius of the earth now obviously if you were orbiting the earth from somewhere like here then this would be very different but we don't do that because it's never going to have enough force to stay in the orbit so yeah assuming that it's close enough g is 9.81 r is 6400 kilometers and so if we do the math that gives us v is 7.92 times 10 to the power of 3 meters per second which means 8 kilometers per second. So we have to launch satellites exactly at like this digit in order to keep it in orbit. And this is obviously different if you're talking about things around the moon or things around the sun because they have different radii, they have different G values. And yeah, I think that's about it for centripetal force and the equations that you can derive out of it. So thank you for watching.